Well, good morning. Good morning. For those of you we've not yet met, I'm Pastor Bob Miller, and let me add my welcome to all of you who are worshiping together this morning. And, and any time you may be worshiping during the week, I'm going to talk a little bit in a, in a minute about how we, we can reconnect with these services uh, throughout the week over and over again. But today we wrap up our six-week series on exploring the most foundational or perhaps essential beliefs of the Christian faith as contained in the Apostles' Creed. And, and as, as, as you probably noticed, I keep... I keep emphasizing the, the essential aspect of this because sooner or, or later, each of us, as we continue to work through the, the complexities of our ever-growing understanding of faith and life in a broken world, we would do well to be able to lean on the most foundational, well, basics of our faith in our efforts to, to sort out what, what often appears as conflicting priorities and, and actions. But as the Lutheran theologian Peter Meiderlin, yeah, Meiderlin, that's how he pronounces it, back in the 1600s, he's credited to have basically said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. And here the word, the word charity means love. That's, that's actually the, the, the origin of that word. Anyway, if, if you have missed any of the previous five weeks, you can still, or if you want to review any of the, the messages or worship services from the previous five weeks, you can still see them, but the whole service or just the sermon messages, by going to our website at pfumc.org and, and clicking, I'm stuck. I'm going to fix this. <laughs> and, and clicking the, the Worship Now button that's at the top menu ribbon on the page. And, and then uh, you'll see another thing drop down. And then click right underneath the Watch Recordings label. And so anyway, we, we've come to the last two lines of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the everlasting life. Would you all say that out loud with me? Let's say it together. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Can I have an amen? Amen. Yeah. And I would like to, to set the stage for our discussion by, by uh, first reading some excerpts from the 15th chapter of Paul's first letter to the church of Corinth, or 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins then those who have died in Christ have perished. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish one, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. As, and as far as what you sow... You do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. And when this perishable body puts on imperishability, imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, this is the word, these are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, a little background. The uh, Corinthian church was made up mostly of Gentiles or, or people um, that, with non-Jewish backgrounds. Although there were some that were well-known Jewish Christians that were a part of that church. But still, there had developed some denial of the resurrection by some in the church. So, so Paul, in response, he goes right to the basics on the topic. He begins with full substantiation of the resurrection of Christ. He says, you claim to, to, to stand solidly on the gospel of Christ. So how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Because if Christ wasn't raised, then you guys are still in all your sins. And if that's the case, then basically there's nothing else to talk about. It's all done. But, he says, Christ was raised from the dead. And because of that, it's not all done. There's more to come. Much more. Then he says, and for all you guys who are getting all caught up and, and trying to work out the details about how that's possible, he goes on to say that the body that dies is temporal, weak, full of sin, perishable. But the body that's raised acquires spiritual attributes. It's, it's eternal powerful, cleansed of sin, imperishable. And that it is the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, that God undeniably demonstrates victory. Victory over sin, the forces of wickedness, the powers of evil, even death. Hence, those last two lines in the passage we just read. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you see, what Paul is telling us through this passage is if the forgiveness of sins is God's answer to human brokenness, then it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God provides the antidotes to human sin and human mortality. As, as we experience the throes and losses of life in this world, we all, sooner or later, will ask questions around where or what this is all leading to. Is there something more after our mortal bodies die? Is there any part of us that continues to live? Is there life after death? To which the bottom line essentials of the Christian faith, articulated admittedly succinctly, but articulated in this creed, say unequivocally, yes. The resurrection being one of those bottom line essentials. Nearly 2,100 years ago, Christ died on the cross for our sins. But on the third day following, Christ was resurrected from the dead. And therefore, Christ lives today. But the best part is what that all means for us today, which Jesus proclaimed himself as captured in John chapter 14. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. And not only in eternal life, which, which is a big deal, but, but also life in the here and now. Because by conquering death, Jesus addresses our fears and our burdens of uncertainty and offers us a peace that sustains us. Even in the face of our darkest hour, our most 
overwhelming tragedy, our greatest pain. Death does not have the final word. Certainly not in heaven, where, where, as it says in the book of Revelation, death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And where beauty and glory are off the charts, even compared to the most beautiful things here on earth. But also, quite arguably, death cannot claim the final word in this time and place. For knowing that there is the resurrection and knowing what that resurrection really means empowers us with the hope of that resurrection. The hope that enables us to live in the peace of God's presence. A peace that no worldly circumstance has the power to diminish or even touch. It's been said that what you believe about death substantially influences how you live. And I, for one, believe that. It certainly leads to facing the prospects of mortal death with more courage, with, with a deeper peace. And I know that many of us have absolutely witnessed such courage and peace from people that we have had the privilege of being with as they journeyed to their new life. But also, knowing the ultimate end game really helps us to, to, to put, well, and to keep this earthly life and what we do in and with our lives in perspective. Many of the things that the world would have us fear, we learn are powerless in the big picture. And, and many of the things the world would convince, convince us are important or valuable cannot even compete with what is offered and made available to us through the gifts of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So, here we are. We have come to the conclusion of our relatively brief journey through the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith as captured and articulated in the Apostles' Creed. And so let's recap our journey by joining together and reciting one more time the Apostles' Creed as displayed on your screens. No matter where you are, go ahead and recite this out loud, even if you're in a coffee shop, because th these are good words even for those patrons there as well. And, and say it loudly. Let's, let's, let's join together. Here we go. I believe in God the Father, mighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. In other words... We believe in the triune God, three in one. As God the, the Father Almighty is creator of heaven and earth. As God the Son is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As God the Holy Spirit is ever present and sustains us. We believe in the universal church ordained by Christ ultimately unified in the communion of saints as all God's children. And we believe in the forgiveness of sins, God's answer to our brokenness. And we believe in the resurrection and life everlasting, which demonstrates once and for all the victory 
of God's goodness over sin and even death. And as we embrace and remember these essentials and, and, and map them on Christ's demonstration of the, of the gospel message, we can more easily see how God answers our deepest wounds, our greatest longings, even our doubts and questions in our hearts. We are able to stand on the strong foundation of what is true. We are led and enabled to continuously and increasingly direct our daily lives in ways that, that put into action, into words, even into thoughts, that which reflects the essentials of what God would have us do. And through it all, we are given hope, real hope. And so, my good friends, may such a foundation empower your trust and faith in the triune God who loves you more than, than words can describe. That your awareness and embrace of God's presence may continue to increase with each passing day of your mortal lives. That you may live in and live out a peace that is beyond understanding and a way that reflects the unmistakable Christ-likeness that has been planted within you. May it be so. Amen.